welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today, our guest is Nathan Hunt. Nathan is a student at Portland State University with a major in political science and is involved in calling attention to the huge and growing issue of student debt. He's been a leader in activating people to work on the issue and pr proposing innovative solutions via a student group called Students for Educational Refo Debt Reform. So welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's Populist Dialogues. Thanks for having me out. Good, yeah. Yeah, so um, talk about the problem of student debt. Well, I mean, the problem is, is that a lot of uh, states have disinvested in higher ed, and what used to be the highest form of aid being grants and scholarships has now been replaced by loans. So when you have your graduates coming out of college, they're normally carrying quite a lot of debt, and the average uh, borrower at Portland State has $25,000 worth of debt. Wow, okay, that's, that's a lot of debt. So um, how have we gotten to a position now where well, the one you said that uh, the state is uh, is not investing in in higher education. And can you give us an idea why that is? Well, because I think at the end of the budgeting process, higher ed is the last one to sort of get addressed. They got to go through primary and then secondary education. Then by the time it's post secondary, there's often not a left not enough money left over. And you know now that students are paying a tuition portion of the expense, you know, there's been this sort of impetus to raise the tuition levels to fill that gap. Plus, a lot of people see education as a person going and trying to better themselves, seeking benefits for themselves, and don't see the aspect of an education that it provides a public good and public benefit. So it just sort of is the last in line, and people are a little less sympathetic to uh, it. Okay. And, and so, so the state doesn't invest in public education, therefore the universities are uh, required to increase the amount of tuition and fees? Right, yes. Okay. okay. And uh, at the same time that that's happening, uh, the when I went to Portland State, 19, I graduated in 1972, uh, most of my expenses were covered by grants and I got a couple of loans, but when I graduated from Portland State with a BS in sociology, and so long ago I don't remember, <laughs> in sociology, uh, I think I owed $500. Right. And now you're saying that the standard amount that students own is going to be in the area twenty five thousand dollars. Right. Yeah, about that. Um, right. So, so the whole process of giving grants to students uh, is gone. Well, you still get Pell grants, and they're up to five thousand dollars a year from the federal government. And then you have an Oregon Opportunity Grant, which is a grant that's based off a of need, which is close to two thousand dollars a year but tuition runs about $8,000 a year. And plus, a lot of folks, because you know they're in a housing situation, maybe on campus that's quite expensive, they can't work full time, they gotta take out loans just for cost of living. Oh, yeah. So even after you get past that whole tuition portion of college expense, there's the whole cost of living portion. Okay, all right, uh, yeah, and, and that of course makes a lot of sense, and I hadn't even thought about that, I actually, uh, being a native Portlander, I lived at home when I was yeah. in school, so I didn't have that, uh, that th those those expenses for for myself. Um, how did you get focused on this problem? Portland State um, requires that their students um, on their graduation track take a senior capstone course, and I selected the student debt advocacy course that provided at by the university and. We looked at the issue, we uh, looked at some solutions that uh, we found desirable and, and sort of really dug in and did the research and, and presented our solutions to a panel of legislators in December. Okay, all right. And, and these capstone uh, courses, these are specific, are, are they, uh, um, oh, dis describe well the program. What, the, what the I think the specific aim of them is to get students involved with the community, so when in the course we had community partners and they specialized in, in uh, debtors advocacy and so we were able to touch base with them and even though their focus was different from ours they were sort of focusing on debt uh, traditionally and 
uh, developing countries, but now they're starting to focus on domestic issues because they're seeing some of those predatory lending patterns that were being sort of foisted on these developing countries now being thrust upon you know, people domestically. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we are becoming a third world nation. I guess so. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> but that really is a reality people need to face is that yeah. the, the problems that we have always thought were you know, problems in banana republics, uh, you know, in South America or in Africa uh, are really problems that we all experience now today. Right. Yeah, a and, and college students in particular. Um, so, uh, so you were meeting with these other uh, activist experts. What kind of solutions did you kind of come up with? Well, the one that we focused on most of all was based on a report from a think tank up in Seattle, the Economic Opportunity Institute. The man that wrote the report, John Burbank, uh, called it Pay It Forward. And it was, uh, tr it was focused on making, uh, well, providing tuition-free education for University of Washington and the Washington system. We adapted that to the Oregon University system and were provided spreadsheets numbers from Jason Gettle of the Oregon Center for Public Policy. He's, he, he's been a guest on this program. Yeah, he's really, uh -huh. really nice and did a really thorough job. And so we, when we saw that, it kind of, we hadn't expected to be shown something like that. We instantly were very drawn to it and decided to take that, uh, to propose that policy to legislators. Okay, and you say the, the uh, proposal is that um, students should have access to higher education without debt? Without debt. Um, the, the tenets of this proposal would be that students would, you know, when they enroll to school, uh, before being accepted, they would sign a binding agreement to the institution stating that they would pay the, uh, I guess, the Oregon University system or this fund that would, that would pay tuition for students on the front end, a percentage of their adjusted gross income for a set amount of years. But it wouldn't be a loan because there wouldn't be any specific amount of money doled out to the students. It would just be an accumulation of um, a percentage of adjusted gross income built up throughout their you know, college experience. So it'd be about three quarters of one percent their uh, adjusted gross income for every 45 credit hours attended, which would, if you went to school for four years and didn't have any, you know, significant overages of credit hours accumulated, it would be three percent for a bachelor's degree. Hmm. Okay, a and a and so uh, for signing this essentially contract, uh, then they would not charge you for the tuition a and the fees? Is that yep, you would have tuition and fee-free education on the front end. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't, I mean, it probably wouldn't eliminate debt altogether because there's still that cost of living side yeah. to college expense. But what it would mean is that you would have a lot of students coming out with very small amounts of debt. And you'd have a lot of students coming out with no debt. Because by that point in time when you can get uh, the tuition portion taken care of, you know, a student can get a part-time job and, you know, handle their cost of living that way. Mm -hmm. Plus, it wouldn't do anything to impede on the federal Pell Grant scholarship. So you'd still see students that were getting tuition-free education getting, you know, $4,500 every year in that, pe in that federal Pell Grant. Okay. A and and uh, I, I'm not really familiar with Pell Grants. We didn't have them when I was in school. T tell us just a little, little detail about Pell Grants. Uh, it's just a grant you apply for when you're doing your um, FAFSA every year and uh, when you're applying for those um, loans and, and grants, uh, it's just first come, first serve, and it's about $4,500 a year. Okay. And are there restrictions on who gets those? Or is I don't it first come, first it's serve? It's first come, first serve. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's, it, when it was, it hasn't, it's been static for a long time, the amount given out uh, for the grants. So, I mean, it used to be, it pretty much captured all the costs of tuition and fees. But as those have inflated over the years, it doesn't do as much to pay those. It's still a significant help, no oh. doubt. But uh, it's not as much as it used to be. Okay. All right. A a and Talk a little bit more, if, if you would, about the problem, uh, you know, about how large this problem of student debt is, not for the individual students, but for America. Well, it's, a, it's an enormous debt. Um, since, you know, in 2008, the collapse in that third quarter of that year, it's the only form of household debt that's increased since then. You know, a lot of the household debt's gone down, you know, through 
uh, foreclosures and stuff, not necessarily good things, but you know, house, household debt has gone down generally since 2008 with the exception of student debt. And uh, it eclipsed $1 trillion nationwide in outstanding student debt. Last quarter alone saw $42 billion added to outstanding student debt. Uh, to give you an idea of that, uh, I think car loan debt over that quarter was $18 billion. So, I mean, it's, it's outpacing some very high ticket items. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's, it's something that, that should concern people because when you have that debt hanging over these young people, these people that are building their life, it, it stymies a lot of potential economic growth. Mm -hmm. And it would be a, it would certainly discourage young folks from going to school at all. It discourages people from going to school. I mean, certainly people that are disadvantaged that, you know, have never had money see school is perhaps a prospect of just perpetuating, a, you know, a, a situation they're familiar with of not having much money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it does begin to almost eclipse the reward that promise higher education is supposed to deliver. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of people that have been dissuaded. Right, okay. A and what's the effect on the economy of student debt? I, I haven't seen any specific numbers. I just, I think when you, when you have people with debt, they're not making those purchases. I mean, they're holding off on purchasing homes. They're holding off on purchasing cars. They're holding off on other goods and services. And so there's this trickle-down effect by people holding onto their money. There's also, you know, these lenders aren't local lenders. I mean, they're all across the country. They're on the same places where, you know, many of the credit card companies and all the other big banking entities are. So in the state of Oregon, when someone cuts the check to their lender, that money goes out of the state. and It's mm -hmm. never coming back. So you know, all over the country, you're seeing these dollars just basically being thrown out of state. And th I mean, that has a big hurtful effect on economies. Uh, yeah, right, yeah. A a and uh, I I'm glad you mentioned th the fact that if students or former students are being required to pay off those loans, then they're not buying uh, the cars and the houses and consumer goods that are the primary uh, economic engine for our economy. Right. Uh, so there's a huge drag on the economy yeah. from the from those from those debts. Well, especially since it's it's a consumer economy now. Mm -hmm. I mean, to to uh, put the brakes on that in any way is going to be obviously hurtful. Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, if um, if this pay it forward program um, charges this percentage, and you've contracted. Um, how is that? Uh, how would that be different than just repaying your loans? You're not building interest. You know, there's if you were to go into default, it, it wouldn't run away from you. It wouldn't snowball. Um, if it, it would be a manageable contract to to meet your obligations on whether you were making twenty thousand dollars a year or two hundred thousand dollars a year, because it's all proportional. Whereas with a loan, you know, the terms of your loan are the terms of your loan. And if you're not making so much money, that mm -hmm. could be particularly onerous. And if you do well, then it's not so much of a problem for you. Mm -hmm. And if you're with a loan, whether you're employed or not employed, you still owe that money. Right. Uh, and you still are obligated to make that, make that payment. So uh, with the pay it forward, uh, you've obligated yourself to pay a certain percentage of your income right. on an annual basis. Right. Uh, and do you do that for your, for the rest of your life? Or, or About what? 25 years, 24 years is what under uh, Jason Gettle's numbers is what was prescribed. Uh -huh. So, okay. and it was it was pretty impressive. I mean, it's obviously very expensive on the front end, very front heavy are these costs. Uh, you don't see any money coming back in from graduating cohorts until four years in. So, so you're talking about the program, not on the individual. Yeah, on the on the overall program, uh -huh. it would be expensive because you know. The, no one's paying back to the state for the first four years. Right, yeah, so then bringing up the question, where does the money come from? Well, that's, that's something that we've talked about, and it seems as if, you know, you'd have to go through some bonding. Um, the conversation has talked about diverting Oregon Opportunity Grant funds because, you know, in a 
state where you wouldn't have any more tuition and fees being paid by students, you wouldn't need the Oregon Opportunity Grant anymore. Plenty of opportunity would be brought forth by this new system. Mm -hmm. So that would get some of the cost down. But that cost gap would have to be answered to by most likely grants, or um, I'm sorry, uh, bonds. Bonds, okay. So the state would sell bonds to uh, to get the to get the initial startup going and provide the funds because obviously uh, the the universities still need to have their funds coming in. Oh yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, was, was there in, in your um, Keystone ca capstone? capstone capstone in your capstone pro uh, class? Was there any discussion about other ways of of lowering the cost of education? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when we we visited some of uh, our representatives out in Salem recently, and you know the the, the Republicans we've spoken to have, uh, you know, they acknowledge the cost problems of school. And it's more of a conservative take on it that they say, why is it so expensive? Why do you take so many courses? Why don't we prepare people in high school better and offer more college level courses? So a person might even be able to accumulate a year's worth of college credit once they graduate. And by that point in time, you know, it doesn't look like such an uphill climb. You know, you say, look, I've already got a year of credits at my back. This isn't going to be so bad going to school after all. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that. I, there's a lot of good ideas about how do we pay for it, but how do we reduce the costs? I was kind of lamenting to my wife the other day. I said, you know, I paid to learn how to bowl. And I, you know, why we still have PE in college? <laughs> I mean, it's sort of crazy. But mm -hmm. there's definitely some costs that could be cut. OK. And is there an equity issue with regard to people that might be coming out of college with a bachelor's degree in political science, say, uh, versus someone that's coming out of medical school? Uh, obviously, the doctor is going to get paid more than right. the political scientist. Right. And so, they, is it fair for each of those to pay the same? Yes, I mean, it's proportional. It would it would be percentage of their income, and it would be a percentage of the political scientist's income. Oh, okay. You know, they, right. they yeah, wouldn't yes, be because we're not talking about a fixed sum of money. We're talking about a percent of their right. annual income. Right. And with all that additional, and this was something that we didn't really discuss, but it was something that was addressed in Burbank's report, was that if someone went to uh, get an advanced degree and he looked at medical doctors, and under his proposal, he was thinking a person would pay four percent on a bachelor's degree. And then the person that went to all that additional school to get their medical degree would pay 5% as opposed to 4%. So all they would only tack on that one extra percent because they'd capture more money through that person's much higher sure. income. Uh -huh. So it would be a little bit more equitable mm -hmm. that way because you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't tack on as much uh, added percentage. Right, yeah. A and, and figuring at 3%, of your annual income, that would be considerably less than repaying loans at a fixed uh, amount. It certainly could be. It yeah, I mean, depending on what a person does, I think. I think. So, if if you average fifty thousand dollars a year, which would be doing pretty well, you know, over the whole earning mm -hmm. curve, the first twenty four years out of college, you'd wind up paying back thirty thousand dollars over 24 years, 25 mm -hmm. years. So um, it, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be prohibitive or onerous. Uh -huh. Great. Yeah. Well, it would certainly be less than what they currently are expected to, to pay. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, and then the, the other thing I really like about it is that, you know, uh, the, the, the first year after I graduated, I probably have usually low income. And so 3% of low income is still a low amount. Right. Uh, 10 years out, I've got a good job and a reasonable salary, and I'm paying 3%, and so the amount that I'm paying uh, also goes up. Right. Uh, which seems like it's a very fair. Which is why it's a long payment period, you know, because you want to capture that curve. I mean, a person, as they go through their employment life, begins to make more and more money, and, and they kind of hit a peak. And, and to get that, to get payments from the people in this system, you kind of want to you know, have them in a contract for the long run so you uh -huh. can capture that. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. How, how would this work for uh, out-of-state students? Well, 
they well they wouldn't probably be eligible this was always discussed for just people that are in state Okay. So anyone that's eligible for in-state tuition would be eligible to be in the system. Uh -huh. And uh, there was a couple of ways they thought of it that perhaps there would be a different percentage scale of adjusted gross income if it were someone that was, you know, applying from out of state. Or But I think at the end of the day they were saying, well, why not just have out-of-state students pay in the way that is done now? Okay, yeah. And I presume that this would only work for Oregon students who are going to Oregon universities. So, uh, you know, if you're going to Washington State University, you, you wouldn't. Be no. Able to do yeah, that it would just be so. Oregon's state colleges mm -hmm. and universities. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, what would a tuition free education in Oregon mean for those who have no intention of going to college? Well, it would, it would take the shackles off of those graduates to be, uh, to live up to their potential as consumers, as citizens, you know, to, to uh, go to the shops and patronize local businesses, not send their dollars out of the state, but also to do the job that they were meant to do. You know, a lot of people when they get out of school, if they find any sort of gainful employment, they mm -hmm. say, well, I found it. You know, I found something. It's not what I wanted to do, but I found something. They could do the thing that they're most suited to do. So they're serving the community better in that way. They're serving the community better is in as far as their uh, civic responsibilities. You know, there's lots of evidence. People vote more, uh, participate in politics more, mm -hmm. uh, just generally get involved more when they when they go and get their college education. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a bill in the Oregon legislature now for doing this. Yes, it's a uh, House Bill 2838. And it's going to establish a task force to look at this and, you know, look at the merits of a pay it forward program and hash out how they might be able to implement it. And it's right, in, it's in the uh, committee on higher ed right now. And I think it's going to go into the education subcommittee for ways and means pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's beginning to move along a little bit. Should have, uh, have a vote on the floor of the house sometime this summer, I believe. Okay, good. And, and who have you aligned with or who are your allies? We've been, well, we've been working with uh, the Working Families Party, uh, Jubilee Oregon's another group that we've been working with, and we've been speaking to legislators individually trying to, you know, express the merits of this legislation and how it would be important to Oregon and Oregon students. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And, and have, um, have legislators been receptive or is this just so out of the box? They always think it's interesting. They're always happy to hear it. Um, you know, uh, there are people that are right there, you know, we're preaching to the choir and they're completely on board. There's some folks that are a little bit more conservative and they see the problem with education as a problem with runaway costs. And uh, that's, I mean, there's merit to that side of the argument too. Mm -hmm. So it seems, it seems like some uh, legislators who might be of a more conservative bend and more um, pro-business that would say, "Wow, this is leaving all the loan companies out, you know, uh, out of the equation, and they deserve to make a profit too." Right. But it doesn't cut them out of the loop because there's still the cost of living side of going to school. There would still be loans. I mean, it, it, I mean, we would be dishonest to say it would eliminate loans altogether, but it would reduce them significantly. For some students, it would eliminate loans altogether. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good. Well, uh, that, I think, concludes our program. Thank you very much for being here, Nathan. Thank you. All right. Good. Our guest today has been Nathan Hunt. He has been talking about the problem of student debt, both for the students who are accumulating it and for the future of the nation. His proposed solution is called Pay It Forward. More information on Pay It Forward is available on the Oregon Working Families Party website at tinyurl.com slash payitforwardoregon. Uh, after you learn more about the proposal, contact your state representative and tell them to support Pay It Forward and House Bill 2838. So I want to call your attention to two upcoming events in Portland. Uh, first, the Progressive 
radio talk show host Tom Hartman is going to be back in Portland for a public event on Friday, April 26th. Tom is author of over 25 books on a variety of topics. He is on equal protections, the rise of corporate dominance, and the theft of human rights is one of the most important books written on the history of the development of corporate power, and to my knowledge, the only one which addresses how free trade agreements are the most current effort by corporations to dominate decision making in both the United States and world worldwide. Tom is in Portland at the First Unitarian Church for a public presentation promoting the 28th Constitution Amendment to end the corporate created, excuse me, the court created doctrines of corporate personhood and money as speech. The event starts at 7 p.m. The church is located at Southwest 12th and Main in downtown Portland. And if you live in Salem, Tom will be in Salem on Saturday, April 27th at 1 p.m. at the Grand Theater at 191 High Street Northeast in downtown Salem. The second event is brought to Portland by Move to Mend, the national group which advocates both for a democracy movement in the United States as well as a 28th constitutional amendment. They, they have organized a series of grassroots democracy convergences during 2013. One will be here in Portland during the weekend of May 3rd through May 5th. Location will be at Portland Community College Cascade Campus. More information and to register, go to movetomen.org slash 2013-convergences. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end a corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Learn more at our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or at Portland website at afd-pdx.org. We want to thank our volunteers who donate their time to get our program on the air. Again, we want to thank Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Lori Sutton, Tom Thomas, and Brad Leach. And I want to thank all of you for watching. Thank you. I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye.